Dr. Sharon Willis has spent a life dedicated to the arts. Harboring an early interest in music, she has been able to blaze her own path, and at the age of 50 became the first woman to found her own theater company, the Americolor Opera. She's the subject of this edition of Art Comes Alive as we learn about how she got started in the arts and uses the craft to entertain and preserve culture. Lastly, Dr. Willis showcases three separate performances from her opera company. Art Comes Alive. Dr. Sharon Willis, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Um, I just want to get right into it. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, how did you get started? Well, I am a product of the Atlanta public school system. And my first experience with music, of course, was singing in the chorus in elementary school. And I had great teachers. And from there, I went to Washington High School. And I had a great choral director, Mr. William Revere, who taught us about sight re reading and taking us to the symphony and taking us to opera. And when I got to college, I thought I was a pianist. I was trained to be a pianist. But then I had a voice teacher that discovered my voice. It's not that I couldn't sing. I never considered myself a soloist. But she said, you have this operatic voice. And so it was the voice that found me. I didn't find the voice, but she found me. And she introduced me to the world of opera. And I thought that that was an unreachable thing because usually in the city, um, and especially in African-American culture, that might not be something that you would pursue. But it was fun. And I was introduced to Porgy and Bess and Aida and all these wonderful things. And my goal was to be this opera singer and I was going to Indiana University and all of that. But of course, circumstances always change. And I was also a composer. I began composing when I was in high school and I just thought, Composition gave me a, a way of expressing. I was a very, you wouldn't believe this, introverted, shy child had been separated from my parents, and that was a way of consoling me. And uh, that, that world of composition and singing came together, and I began to arrange and write. I became a church musician. And those two lives parallel, being a music teacher, being a church musician, and all that I am as a, a musician uh, is a combination of those things. That sounds amazing. Thank you. I'm curious, could you tell us a little bit about your opera company? The opera company came about in celebration of my 50th birthday. A lot of people have birthday bashes and you want to go out on the town and just drink and have a good time. And I thought, what would represent a legacy in my life? Where have, wh what does my journey speak of? And I thought, why not as a writer, because I thought I was a little poet when I was like nine or 10 years old. So writing, I took dance, I was a pianist. I knew all these people, these talented musicians, and it just flowed into what could you do that was exceptional for 50? Not something that's common. And the word opera came up. I had no idea what to write about. And then I've heard from my English professor, write about what you know, the track of becoming an opera singer is a very difficult road, and most of us don't make it. Sopranos, I will say, dime a dozen. And then when they get to the end of all of their training, what do you do, where do you go? And so I called my first opera, The Opera Singer, and it was a highlight of my struggle as a young person, a young African-American woman, trying to pursue this career of opera, and I was laughed at by my peers and so even when I was in the church choir, I sang with the, the choral choir because I had that voice, but I had to sing with the gospel choir to please my friends. <laughs> so in the opera, that's what it's about. And I also look at a historical perspective of what African-American opera singers had to go through, including Marian Anderson and uh, Roland Hayes. 
And then I highlighted the story of Sissy Aretta Joyner Jones, who would have been, or shall I say should have been, the first African American to sing in the, for the Metropolitan Opera. But when they wanted to offer her the contract of singing what they call the dark rose, like Lachme and Aida, there were some disgruntled patrons who said, if you give her that role, we will withdraw all of our funding. Yeah. And so that would fall upon Marian Anderson being the first, some 60, 70 years later, because this woman was singing at Madison Square Garden in 1892. Oh, wow. So I'm, I'm curious, you're talking about African Americans and opera. What are you trying to, what stories are you trying to tell in your operas? My how, operas are not. How important is that background for you? It's very important because it's an unsung story. It, there's a richness of story and history and culture in the African American experience that it's just not known. And as a researcher, a his, historical researcher, I love uh, that. I've, I've been immersed in that since I was a child about the African American experience because I came up just prior to real uh, desegregation. And so that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. 365 was Black History Day. It was not a month just celebrated in February. It was every day that you learned about uh, historical characters and their significance. So when I began this opera company, I was thinking of how do you tell our story and preserve our culture? And yet I have this voice and a lot of my friends have this classical voice. And I began to look at stories in the history that I had learned as a young person. So after the opera singer and talking about Sissy Aretta Joyner Jones, I thought about Alonzo Herndon. I had gone to visit that beautiful mansion over there on University uh, Street in Vine City, where Mars Brown is located. And there was a spirit in that house. Here is a young man that was a slave. He was the product of a slave woman and his master who would not regard him as his son. In fact, he was cruelly treated and beaten because of it, because he could have passed for any white man. Mm -hmm. And this man then would leave Social Circle, Georgia, at the age of maybe 11 or 12, and walk to Jonesboro and learn the barbering trade, and would eventually end up at 66 Peachtree Street with one of the most elite barbershops in the country. 25 seats, crystal chandeliers, and his clientele was the upper echelon society of, of white society. Yeah. In fact, he could not even enter into the front door. He entered into the back door, oh, wow. and he became a millionaire, yeah. cutting white people's hair until he went into the insurance business, and that's where we hear of Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Interesting. I did not know any of you that. See? Yeah. You see, but the African-American experience does not exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. it, it, we can tell our story, but it involves the American experience mm -hmm. within that, that African-American experience because it's shaped where we are. So do you seek to maybe teach, do you think we're missing that in our society, like younger generations, maybe whether it be they're not interested or they just don't know maybe about their history? What, like, it, does your operas, um, is it to inform, is it to entertain? Like, what, what are you trying to do? It's a combination of the two, but its primary purpose is really to educate, to preserve culture. And then I'm looking at the singers that are hungry for opportunities. And we have a lot of talented, classically trained singers. I just don't use the classically trained. I have in my opera sometimes the jazz singer. I will have the gospel singer. I will have actors that don't sing at all because in my operas, I'm not Puccini, I'm not writing Verdi, I'm not writing Wagner, I'm writing Sharon Willis, I'm writing about the American experience and I'm not just writing Afrocentric culture. I've written an opera called The Callens uh, um, of Callenwall where I'm talking about the Coca-Cola family. Okay. All right, so, and then I write about um, social things, medical things. I wrote an opera called Pink Lady, addressing uh, breast cancer. That's, it's a broad subject. It's not just the black experience. Mm -hmm. I will take it from that angle, but it actually is to inform. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's part of education. Indeed, it is. Amazing. Um, I'm curious, what are, can you talk about some of the works we're going to see today? 
Yes, I have three excerpts that I would like to for you to see today. The first one is from Pink Lady. I was talking about the breast cancer opera. Mm -hmm. And the scene that you see, there's a mother. She's a highly religious woman. And she's experienced breast cancer. She has a daughter that she knows is very fearful of that. But a daughter has gone into more of a secular type world. She's this class one upcoming fashion designer. And she actually discovers a lump in her breast. But fear takes over and she does not want to face the fact that because her mother had this, she figures, I'm going to die from this. And rather than seeking help, she just falls to her anxiety. So her mother sings this song, all I can do is trust him, and so can you. Wow. And the second excerpt is from an opera called The Seduction of King Solomon. As we know, The Seduction of King Solomon. Solomon is supposed to be what? One of the wisest kings that, that ever lived. But he is seduced by these women, these queens and princesses that he meets in foreign lands, which is forbidden in his faith. Not only is he seduced by these women, he brings them into his court and builds temples so that they may worship their gods. And all the prophets that are around him object to this, but what? He's the king. He has brought Israel to uh, its most successful point in life and history. And so um, this queen Amira that he has met in Egypt is now his queen, but he has just met the queen of Sheba. Mm -hmm. And as a king, you could have as many concubines and wives as you wanted to. But this queen or this princess Amira is a very jealous woman. Now that may not be true in history, but who knows? I'm just speaking as a woman. If you're, you're married to me and I'm, a, I'm royal blood and you've got to bring someone else in, that doesn't speak well. Mm -hmm. So that second excerpt is called Beloved where he meets her in this, this fake temple or this false god temple mm -hmm. to, to complain about you have not been at my bedside. Okay. And then the last one is an opera I call Three Kings and a Prince. We all know about the holy child born December 25th, even though it really wasn't December 25th, we accept that mm -hmm. date. And so there are three angels, Alpha, Omega, and the Messenger, and they are out there to tell the world, look for the Eastern star, there's a child being born. And so I write a spiritual, actually, behold that star. And that is the third excerpt that you will hear. Interesting. So just winding this down, I'm just curious for maybe budding artists or people out there who want to get their voice out there, what, what advice do you have to, to, for them? Pursue your passion, pursue your passion. I never would have thought at 18 or 28, even 40, that I would have an opera company, that I have stood for 17 years, mm -hmm. that I have more than 40 or 50 opera singers. And there's, there's work. If you love it and you want to pursue it, you do it. You also find people that are doing what you want done. Mm -hmm. I have a brand new opera coming up called The Goddesses of Quasar. It's my sci-fi opera. Oh, wow. I, I've never written a sci-fi opera. Okay. But... Even saying that, it has a message, and the message is I've got these warrior woman, women who used to just kill everybody on earth. That's mm -hmm. like what sci-fi. And they get through this crystal portal, and they become peacekeepers. And then they betray this when their two, warrior, two male warriors breach the portal door and steal their power. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a Wonder Woman type thing. Right, right. And That's they go back thinking. through the portal. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and to destroy them, but they lose the purpose of their life. So that means there's a message there sometimes, and that's that's actually going to be premiered this fall in September. Oh, it sounds really interesting. Oh, yes. Well, go on the website. Yeah. May I say that? Please do. www.americolorapera.org, and you will find what we are presenting at any time. Great. Well, I want to thank you again for being on the show today, and I'm really excited to see these performances. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here.
to go, no place to go. All I can do is trust him. Why don't you? He's my strength and my joy. He's my doctor, my medicine, my hope for tomorrow, my sunshine on a cloudy day. Is he? Trust him. Why don't you? Why don't you trust him every day? You know the Lord will make a way. He'll be your shelter in a storm. He'll keep you from a earthly harm. And all you got to do is call on him to give you peace of mind. And you will find a perfect friend in precious Jesus. Precious Jesus. Precious Jesus, 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 how I trust him, how I've proved him all and all, why don't you? Trust him to This is where I find you, in the temple of Ashtoreth, in deepest lamentation. Why do you cry out? Why have you not come to me? You have forsaken my bedside for Makeda, <laughs> the queen of Sheba. I have not forsaken our bedside, but you have forsaken your loyalty to your king. Am I not the Pharaoh's daughter? Am I not the king of all Israel? Sworn to protect, provide, and lead my people into greatness. And what of my heart, my protection, and my provision? <laughs> Spoken out of the mouth of a spoiled child. You have everything. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have you. The Queen of Sheba has come to pay great homage to the King of Israel. She's come seeking an understanding of God's chosen. She's come seeking the knowledge of the God of Israel. And if she so chooses to share her bed with me, then so be it. For now Sheba stands as an ally, not an enemy of Israel. An ally with Sheba? No need. There's no greater ally than the Pharaoh of Egypt, and I am his daughter. Surely, it would be more pleasant to sit in the path of a beehive than to listen to the wanton complaints of a noisy wife. Your words are like the sting of a queen bee. But I say this. Pleasant words are like honey, sweet and inviting to the soul. Amira, who are you? Pharaoh's daughter or Solomon's queen? 
Solomon. I beg of you, do not leave my side. Did you not seek me out? Spoken like Solomon's queen. Mm -hmm. Now come, let us not bicker, but let us make love. Speak soft words, drink sweet wine, and sing sweet love songs. Oh. 
Is the star.